Hello and a very warm welcome to a brand new edition of To The Point with me, Frank Pereira on Rajya Sabha Television. Ever since uh, the Kashmir unrest began, uh, Pakistan has been needling with India. What should India's foreign policy be towards Pakistan? How do we deal with a trouble, troublesome neighbor? And then if you bring in China into the mix, then it's an all new ball game altogether. To talk about all this and what India should do with its troubling neighbors, I have with me former diplomat, author, as well as someone who's worked in the Prime Minister's office in the past, Mr. G. Parthasarthi. Mr. Parthasarthi, thank you so much for joining us on the program. You know, as far as Pakistan is concerned, ever since the Kashmir unrest began a couple of months ago, we've seen that Pakistan has been needling India, has been saying that, you know, India, we, sh we should bring in some external agencies and solve the issue because India cannot solve the problem in Kashmir. How does India tackle a troublesome neighbor like Pakistan? Are the policies towards Pakistan at the moment the right way forward? Well, we had given it our best try to open out to Pakistan, to offer a hand of friendship. After all, the Prime Minister personally visited Mr. Nawaz Sharif for, on the occasion of his daughter's marriage in Lahore. What more could we have done by way of gestures? Now, the fact of the matter is that right at the present moment, Pakistan is going through an internal crisis. It has two dimensions. First is the army dimension, wherein the military has effectively rendered the prime minister powerless. All major foreign policy decisions are taken by the military. Even visiting heads of government, like we have President Ashraf Ghani here, yeah. call, call and meet the army chief before they meet the prime minister. More recently, when there was a terrorist attack in uh, Kabul, and the Afghans had information that it had come from across the border, Mr. Ghani rang up the army chief. Yes. And asked him to do something. He didn't ring up Nawaz Sharif. So, Sharif is suffering a crisis of credibility and any move or any sort of uh, excessive forbearance he shows towards India will invite domestic criticism that he is weak. Added to this is the crisis of corruption in his family. Both his sons and daughter are now found to hold bank accounts in Panama. There is a huge demand for investigation which is being stonewalled. The army chief is scheduled to quit on November 30th. One does not know what his larger ambitions are. So in these uncertain circumstances, for Mr. Sharif, what has happened in Kashmir is a blessing. Hmm. He now has the ability to divert attention from all his miseries and woes with the army and with governing the country towards Kashmir. And this is coming at a time when the border with Afghanistan is, is heating up. There have been clashes with Afghanistan forces. The army's offensive against uh, the Tehrik e Taliban, the Pashtuns who live on the border of Afghanistan and Pakistan, has not worked. 50,000 Afghans have fled into uh, Pashtuns, have fled, fled into, into, Af Afghanistan. into Afghanistan. The Pakistanis allege that they are being armed and trained by the Afghans. So, it, there is this huge crisis and basically this is a diversionary attempt, uh, knowing very well that it's going to get him nowhere. Yes, a few Islamic countries and representatives of Islamic countries may pro forma say something, but India's own relations in the last two years with the Prime Minister visiting Saudi Arabia, Qatar, United Arab Emirates and Iran, and you have the Egyptian president here. Serious support in the Muslim world is not going to be forthcoming for Pakistan except from Turkey. Indeed. And then, of course, they have the all-weather friend, Pakistan, uh, China. Indeed. So, you know, we'll talk about Pakistan and China and bring in India also to the mix a little later on the program. But then you spoke about Ghani and you spoke about how Afghanistan is dealing with these matters directly with the military regime in Pakistan. Is that the way forward for India as well? Should that how India go forward? There is a simple problem. The Pakistan army will not talk to us directly. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I cannot imagine an Indian cabinet minister leave alone the prime minister going and calling on the army chief in Pakistan. I mean, we don't want to re reduce our democracy to a farce 
by this sort of thing. So there is this problem. As far as we are concerned, we have even suggested meetings between the army chiefs. Like you have meetings between the DGMOs. DGMOs, yes. Pakistan does not agree because the Pakistan army chief feels he is king. And the Indian army chief functions like an army chief functions in any democracy. Indeed. So that's, what the, that's the problem. You know, this issue has been raised by Pakistan at the UNHRC as well. Mm -hmm. The UNHRC uh, HRC chief has also spoken about it and said that, you know, the, the UNHRC is ready to send a fact-finding team to India to see what the situation like is like in Kashmir. Now, India has given a befitting reply, response to that and said, said that, you know, you look at terrorism em uh, emerging out of Pakistan first, then you talk about Kashmir. Yeah. So, well, I think that was natural. In fact, I think the... Chairman of the Human Rights Commission had exceeded his brief. He had not consulted the Human Rights Council or its members. So I think we've just done the right thing. Um, and in any case, it's not India alone. Uh, the Human Rights Commission and this commissioner have been snubbed by several other countries Indeed, yes. similarly. So um, it, it will end there. The important point is, for domestic reasons, Nawaz Sharif will visit New York for the General Assembly session and make some vigorous speeches criticizing India. That's going to be, and they will try and mobilize demonstrations and so on. The External India. Affairs Minister is going to speak after Nawaz Sharif uh, later on this month. Okay. So do you see some fireworks there? Well, what will happen is that whatever Nawaz Sharif says, we will exercise the right of reply. A junior diplomat or a middle-level diplomat, normally the deputy permanent representative, will give a befitting reply. There's the matter ends. And uh, when we say something, they will exercise the right of reply. And there the matter ends. But the fact is, we have to take note of, they are violating the Simla Agreement by doing this. And moving away from a bilateral settlement. And I do believe that another factor is that they have been emboldened by the across-the-board support they're getting from China. China backed them in the nuclear suppliers group. China has even refused to declare Masood Azhar as a, as a terrorist. What more evidence do we need? Speaking in the Pakistan parliament, Pakistan's own railway minister who was earlier its ISI chief, Acknowledged in Parliament, Lieutenant General Javed Ashraf Qazi is his name, that the uh, Jaisha Mohammed was responsible for the attack on our Parliament. Indeed. You know, uh, adding one, one more item to that list, the China-Pakistan economic corridor runs right through Gilbert Balchistan as well. Mm. So, you know, that too is extremely blatant, but India has not really done much as far as the economic corridor is concerned. Now, let's, let us be very clear. What is our objection to the economic corridor? In 1963, a portion of Pakistan occupied Kashmir in Gilgit, Baltistan, called the Shaksgam Valley, was handed over to China. We've always regarded that as illegal and having no basis in law because Pakistan has no right to cede Indian territory. Now, the entry to Pakistan is through, for this uh, road project, is through Shaksgam Valley and Gilgit Baltistan, that is Pakistan occupied Kashmir. So, our primary objection to that is, how can you build a road on what's our territory without Indeed. our permission? Yes. That's a, a strong objection. We have not objected to China building roads elsewhere. The, uh, and uh, the Chinese have no valid answer for that. More importantly, this road not only goes through what we regard as Indian territory. But it, the road leads to Gwadar. Gwadar is a port on the Bakra, um, uh, Makran Baluchistan coast. Barely uh, uh, 80, 100 kilometers from Bandar Abbas in Iran where we are building a port. The um, port is way it is being developed and overseen by the Chinese is not so much for coastal shipping but as for military uh, vessels also. It is very close to the line through which all our oil supplies come. Indeed. And in fact, 80% of the world's oil trade passes through that area. 
So you're giving China and Pakistan a control over not only our oil trade, but all oil trade in the Indian Ocean. So that, to my mind, is the dangerous part of that road. Because they also were think, talking of a maritime silk belt silk, to link, yes. link up with this road, meaning a sea route to link up with this road. The link up between the road and the sea route is at Gwadar. Indeed. Well, and finally, the one little point I must mention, this agreement has also led to the agreement to establish a fiber optic, optic network between China's Western Command Headquarters in Lanzhou in Xinjiang and the Pakistan Army's GHQ, meaning... There will be a direct There will hotline. be a direct hotline between the militaries of Pakistan and China. Now, when will such a hotline be required? Only if, the, only if both countries, you know, planning for contingencies in the event of a conflict with India. Indeed. So, in security terms, that affects us. Yes, and there's much to be thought about and much to be spoken about as well. It's time for a break right now, but we'll continue talking about the China aspect as far as India is concerned and whether China is a bigger threat to India than Pakistan is. Do stay tuned. We'll be right back in conversation with Mr. G. Parthasarthi. Welcome back. You're watching Rajya Sabha Television in conversation with former diplomat Mr. G. Parthasarthi. Ambassador, uh, before we went into the break, we were talking about China. And I want to ask you this. Is China a bigger threat to India than Pakistan is? And I am averse to using the term threat. I hmm. would say challenge. Hmm. Yes, China is a bigger challenge to India. It is, let's not forget, it's a country with five times our GDP, economically five times as powerful. It has a very large defense industry, produces nuclear weapons, missiles, fighter aircraft. I mean, a defense industry which, let's be real, is far superior to ours. Um, therefore, um, uh, it, what has happened now is there always has been a China-Pakistan tacit alliance. If you go back to the 1971 Bangladesh conflict, I was then posted in Moscow. We were very clear about the extent to which China was helping Pakistan before and during and after the conflict. Yes. So uh, this has continued. We spoke about the uh, One Belt, One Road project. I mean, why do you build a road through Indian territory to a strategic port located to close to our oil supplies uh, uh, in this manner? and then link up the two army headquarters by a fiber optic cable. So obviously this is an alliance attaining new dimensions. In any case, Pakistan cannot make nuclear weapons. Its weapons are all of Chinese design. Uh, the same thing is true, their missiles. And we should be, there is now plans for China to strengthen Pakistan's navy. Yes. With the supply of frigate, frigate, frigates and submarines. So. Uh, is it a challenge? Of course it's a challenge. Uh, but we have to deal with China. Wow. Should our strategy be a little different then? Should we look at Pakistan and China as a joint challenge or should we look at, it, look at them separately? Well, if you are faced with a lion and a cat, hmm. each can be a threat. It, it goes to what extent the threat uh, exists. So I would not put the two on the same level, both will have to be dealt differently. Because China in an ultimate analysis has global ambitions. How long is it going to held, hang along with a state like Pakistan, which is at conflict with all, the, all its neighbors? After all, in the last two SARC meetings, the first of the home ministers, uh, neither uh, Bangladesh nor uh, Sri Lanka, uh, Bangladesh nor Afghanistan participated at the level of Home Minister. It was a junior official. Luckily, in the three ministry meeting of finance ministers, we saw some sense in what they were doing and joined them and the finance minister did not go. Now, you're going to have to take a decision on that in the SARC summit because what is happening is within SARC, Pakistan is blocking all cooperation. 
it is not implementing the SAC free trade agreement. It is required to give us under the SAFTA access to through through its territory for trade. After all, we do so for every country. It does not. It is opposed to uh, opening out trade and economic ties. Um, we had offered Pakistan uh, even uh, uh, services of a satellite by us. They refused and did not want the project. We are going ahead without Pakistan. Um, but they are facing serious problems also from Afghanistan and Indeed. Bangladesh. So yes, I think one thing we should discuss with the Afghans when the president is here is how Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, Bangladesh and India can cooperate in trying to drill some sense into Pakistan at Sark. When it comes three-pronged and not India, they'll have to take notice of it. So they are isolated in Sark. Meantime, I think we should set an example by leaving aside Pakistan and moving ahead with our eastern neighbors. And all our eastern neighbors are member of what we call of BIMSTEC or the Bay of Bengal initiative. And I'm glad that in the BRICS summit which India is hosting, we are not bringing in SARC members. Yes. Because Pakistan would, uh, would ruin the summit. So we brought in members from BIMSTEC, all our eastern neighbors on the Bay of Bengal. So our bad relationship with Pakistan is not preventing the integration of the rest of South Asia and even two Southeast Asian countries in BIMSTEC, you have Thailand and Myanmar, with uh, the emerging countries in the world. So we are serving the interests of our Eastern neighbors. We would love to serve the interests of our Western neighbors. But one Western neighbor does not want us to serve its interests, fair enough. India, talking about the other Western neighbor, not a neighbor anymore mm -hmm. because of uh, Pakistan occupied Kashmir, but Afghanistan's president is in uh, India. Ghani is here, of course, and uh, we've seen him making some damning statements about Pakistan in the recent past. Even on Saturday, he said that if Pakistan blocks India's goods from going to Afghanistan and further, he's going to ensure that Pakistan goods are blocked and do not go to West Asia. So we've seen that Afghanistan's president is coming closer towards India. Well, when, when Mr. Ghani started off, he was under the illusion that he could uh, get a, strike a deal with the Pakistanis to the, to the exclusion of India. Not that we minded being excluded, but uh, it ended in disaster. So he now realizes that he needs India to stabilize the region. Uh, yes, he will be asking for even military assistance. I think we should be forthcoming and give him what he wants. Uh, the, uh, other, uh, the other factor is this diplomatic moving together with Afghanistan is going to, uh, to, uh, is going to be important because at the SARC summit, I mean, if we cho choose not to attend, that's a different matter. But if we are attending, you have to work very closely with Bangladesh and with Afghanistan because Pakistan always creates trouble and it's time to isolate it in Sark and send a very clear message after the, uh, the BRICS meeting where we have all our eastern neighbors that if you want, we'll go along. If you don't want, that's your choice. Of course, we, should, uh, we are now linking up with Afghanistan through Iran. So I think there is a need also for an Iran, Afghanistan, India get together from time to time. And I think that will happen sooner rather than later. But you spoke about Southeast Asia as well. Interestingly, before Prime Minister Modi went to China for the summit, he happened to go to Vietnam first, extend a $500 million line of credit to Vietnam, and then go to China. So was there a message in that for China? If I was Chinese, I would read this message. <laughs> uh, because uh, the fact of the matter is it was not just a $500 million deal. It was a $500 million deal for uh, defense equipment. Yes. Largely patrol boats. I hope we give... Supplies. Will we be giving some Brahmos as well soon? I, even if we do, I don't think we'll make it public. Okay. So, I personally favor it, if you ask me. But as I said, I, I can't see the government uh, making it public. These things will be done discreetly. Uh, but uh, the fact of the matter is that for the first time, we are not being apologetic about ourselves. For the first time, we are telling Pakistan, 
you do this, you will pay a price. We will uh, sort of uh, deal with the rest of SARC, leaving you out. You're telling China that if you choose to support Masood Azhar, then uh, our affection for the Vietnamese increases. It's not uh, uh, something they, that they're going to relish, but I think it's time you started doing this messaging. Because you can't let people trample on you. I mean, bad enough China giving Pakistan nuclear weapons designs, missiles, JF-17 fighter aircraft, frigates, uh, submarines, and so on. Then it's establishing itself in Gwadar. But, uh, you know, to go as far as they're going now needs some signal from our side that, look, uh, we can respond. And I think uh, that is uh, precisely what has happened. So there has been a shift in foreign policy is what you're saying. India tried to reach out to Pakistan. You know, we, we, you spoke about how the Prime Minister went to Pakistan, met Nawaz Sharif for his mm -hmm. birthday, wished him and all of that and came back. But now, since, the, since Pakistan is not reciprocated in the same way as we wanted, clearly the shift has changed and uh, we want to send out a strong message to Pakistan. I think, yes, the message is that uh, we want peace, we want good relations. But, uh, you know, Indian patience cannot be tested indefinitely or our forbearance tested, tested indefinitely. Um, so, uh, if you are, this is your choice, you are, we are constrained to take certain measures. Uh, and uh, wish, uh, uh, this, is a part, this is a part of it. Uh, but I think I would like very clearly to say, remember, Pakistan is at loggerhead with all three of its neighbors with whom it has a land border. You had shootouts on the Afghan border. You had the Afghans complain. You had the Afghan president uh, taking objection to some statements made by General Ashraf Ghan, uh, by uh, General Rahil Sharif. So um, the shootouts have figured in their discussions. And the Afghans are, and Iranians are, you know, talking to each other a lot. So I think in this triangle, uh, the Iran, Afghanistan, India thing would be a good thought given. After all, if Pakistan will not join us, you cannot allow Pakistan to become a hindrance. Yes in the development of the region or in development of our relations with others. Basically, we are saying the message to Pakistan is, you can try your best, but you aren't going to stop us from building a cooperative, peaceful South Asia. Hmm. That's the message. Indeed. And finally, before I let you go, uh, Ambassador, I want to ask you, because even yesterday on Tuesday, we saw that there was a meeting, a delegation from China had come to India to talk about NSG and the way forward. Mm. Why is NSG so important for India? Why does India want to get membership to the nuclear suppliers group? You see, it's, it's the whole question of the fact that before the signing of the India-US nuclear deal, India faced sanctions from 45 countries, okay? The Americans wanted to end sanctions and they persuaded the others to get global sanctions ended. The global sanctions were imposed by the nuclear suppliers group. So therefore, on the whole question of nuclear transfers, and we are going to expand our uh, nuclear power program. The nuclear supplies group, which is a 45 member supplier group, we would like to be on the same page as them. And therefore the membership is important. Indeed. Moreover, there, once you have taken a decision to end nuclear sanctions against India, then why should anyone object to India becoming a member of that very group which ended the sanctions. Doesn't make sense. And for China to say, no, we want Pakistan also. But nobody agreed to end sanctions against Pakistan. Yes. In fact, actually, there are many people in the West who say both China and Pakistan should be sanctioned for violating the non-proliferation treaty by the amount of nuclear weapons materials and uh, designs which China has given to Pakistan. So, um, 
the objective is let's talk to the Chinese and tell them that look, we didn't do this. You were persuaded by the Americans to drop your uh, objections to end of global nuclear sanctions against us. That has happened. Now why on earth you didn't then say that you mm. won't do it unless uh, Pakistan comes in. There, was, there can be no question given Pakistan's proliferation record of sanctions ending against it. Indeed. So this is a deliberate matter, uh, decision uh, against India. And it has come just after a decision where you suddenly felt that Masood Azhar is the representative of the Archangel Gabriel in India and not a terrorist. Indeed. Yes. All right. On that note, we'll have to call it a wrap on this edition of To The Point. Thank you so much, Ambassador, for putting things into perspective for us. It was a pleasure having you on the program. Thank you. Well, that's all the time we have on this edition of To The Point. Thank you so much for watching. See you again next time.